When designing the Super Game Boy, Nintendo went way beyond just putting your Game Boy games onto the TV. From screen borders, to enhanced audio, and multiplayer support, the Super Game Boy has so many bonus features thrown on top of the original Game Boy. But my favorite feature is the addition of color to what are supposed to be black and white games. So today, I want to take a closer look at how this 8-bit portable game console built into a Super Nintendo cartridge is able to add colors to a system that's only capable of displaying four shades of gray, or green as the case may be. In order to understand how the Super Game Boy handles color, we must first understand how the old Dot Matrix Game Boy, or DMG, handles them. All in all, the DMG is capable of displaying a total of a four colors, or rather shades of gray. Those gray shades being shades of green if you're playing on original hardware, but I'll be referring to them as shades of gray for this video. A four color palette can actually be quite perfectly stored in a single byte of data, or eight zeros and ones called bits, and here's how. We can take our eight bits and divide by our four colors, which leaves us with two bits to represent each color. In the case of the DMG, 00, zero is white, zero, 01 is light gray, 10 is dark gray, and 11 one is black. We can then arrange them in any way we want, such as an all-black palette, an all-white palette, or any combination of our colors that we want. Perhaps when hearing this, you recognize that the number 1 corresponds to darker colors and 0 corresponds to lighter ones. In the case of the DMG, this is true, but that doesn't have to be the case. Using the SNES to generate our colors for us, we can set the palette of the Super Game Boy to any 4 out of a possible 32,768 colors. If you're keeping track of bits, the DMG uses 2-bit color, as we discovered earlier, meaning that each color is generated using just two binary digits. The SNES uses 15-bit color, or 2 bytes per color, with red, green, and blue values each getting their own 5 bits. With 15 bits, this of course means we can't fit even one color of our palette into a single byte, let alone four different ones. So then, what's going on? Well, the Super Game Boy is using an indexed color system. Instead of having the two bits per color in our palette represent the actual color, they're actually just indexes pointing to a list of four colors to choose from. Here's an example I designed for the Game Boy clearly displaying our four shades of gray when played on original hardware. If we open up the file in AceBright, we can see our four color gray scale color palette. But, if we set the coloring to be indexed, then when we change a color in the palette, the color changes across the entire image. And if we play it on the Super Game Boy, we can see that in action. In the case of the Super Game Boy, the Super Nintendo generates four colors and stores them in a palette for the Super Game Boy to choose from. By doing this, any games made before the Super Game Boy can retroactively be colorized. And for games made with the Super Game Boy in mind, specific colors can be programmed in. Some developers were even clever about which colors they used and were able to capitalize on the blurry nature of old CRT TVs to squeeze out what looks like a fifth color, but is really just clever use of dithering. You can see this done very well in Puyo Puyo Tsu when you turn on the colorful mode. However, when designing the Super Game Boy, Nintendo took it a step further. The Super Game Boy has a list of a lot of early Game Boy games and automatically assigns them one of the preset palettes. Super Mario Land, Solar Striker, and the first Kirby game all look fantastic. I, I don't think Kirby's palette works very well for most games, but feels like it was probably made to be a preset just so Kirby could have his own palette. While those games got some great presets, I don't love the coloring on Super Mario Land 2. That shade of green is just a bit too bright in my opinion. Though this of course is easily swapped out for another if you so choose. 
But what about the crazy colorful screens in Donkey Kong 94, Kirby's Dream Land 2, or the absolute freaking sleeper hit of the last century, Mole Mania? All of these games utilize the other big color related function of the Super Game Boy, color attributes. There are a variety of different kinds of color attributes you can use. Feel free to pause the video here to learn about the different attributes, but the basic idea behind them is that within a specified rectangle, you can change the colors that our DMG palette is indexing to from a total of four different palettes with some limitations. Let's take a look at another example program I wrote on my Game Boy Pocket again. You can see the pattern of colors simply repeats itself four times. But if we run the same program on a Super Game Boy, we get not one, not two, not three, but four separate palettes with indexes zero to three. Notice, however, that the top left corner of each palette shares the color white. One of the limitations of the four different palettes is that each palette must share the same zero index color. However, that color is up to the programmer to decide. With just a simple change to our palette file, we can change white to be black instead, or even chartreuse if you really wanted to. This is how the title screens and openings of the games I brought up earlier look so good. But there is a limit to this kind of color. The attribute blocks are locked into the same position and can't be moved like you would normally move the background. Plus, both the background and object palette get affected, so it can't be used very well with games with scrolling and moving objects. For this reason, it's usually only used for some cutscenes, title screens, and HUDs. Some notable examples are the stage select screens in DK94, the flags in Street Fighter 2, and perhaps my favorite on the original Game Boy is the art for the Pokemon in Generation 1. However, some Game Boy Color games were made to be backwards compatible with the original Game Boy, and some even have Super Game Boy features, one of the greatest examples being the Generation 2 Pokemon games. While the overworld can only display four colors at a time, colors do change as you walk to different locations and also change depending on the time of the day. And the greatest of all are the redrawn Pokemon battle sprites. The color pops so well on Super Game Boy, and being able to see them on a real television screen as opposed to the GBC's tiny non-backlit screen makes this my preferred way to revisit these games. But Pokemon is far from the only Game Boy Color game to work on the Super Game Boy. There's actually a lot of GBC games that are backwards compatible with the original DMG, though their support for the Super Game Boy ranges quite a lot. Generation 2 Pokemon might just be some of the best, but I'd be a fool not to mention Wario Land 2 and the Game & Watch Gallery games. However, not all games got great support. Now, as amazing as Link's Awakening DX is for Game Boy Color, on Super Game Boy, there's almost no difference between it and the original DMG version of the game. The Super Game Boy already detects if the DMG Link's Awakening game is being played and sets a default palette, one that I think is far too green and doesn't look very good. Whenever I play on Super Game Boy, I always choose a palette with a bit more color diversity. All Link's Awakening DX adds is this admittedly lovely border, but a dedicated palette would have been nice to have too instead of just reusing the default preset. It's still better than R-Type DX though, which has absolutely no Super Game Boy support at all. And it's a huge shame too, because the original R-Type for Game Boy didn't have it either. And it isn't one of the games to be detected by the Super Game Boy. But there are so many Game Boy games out there that have so much extra charm added to them when played on the Super Game Boy. I'm curious to hear what games you all think stand out on Super Game Boy. The hardware limitations developers had to work with for the Game Boy and Super Game Boy created a space for so much creativity and imagination. Designing games and figuring out how to work with the extreme color limitations of their graphics is almost an entirely lost art, but we'll always have the originals to marvel at when we want a morsel of inspiration to chew on. I hope you were able to learn something from all of this. The Super Game Boy is truly a fascinating piece of hardware, and one that I want to explore more. 
If you'd like to support the channel, why not download my Sega Master System game, Space Tombo. The itch.io link will be in the description. I'm Boffner, and thanks for watching. See ya!